try it again. Good morning. How many glad to be in church today? Good. It's an honor for me to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Listen, crazy thing happened in the first service. I've never had this happen before in my life. I get up here, I open up my notes. I've got the wrong notes. I've got a funeral sermon. Oh yeah. Yeah. I had to break, ask Pastor Chad to come up, comic relief. I run out to my car, get the right notes. You talk about being embarrassed and secure in a brand new way. It was crazy, but I got the right notes for you today. And I believe it's going to be good. Let me just say, first of all, how excited I am to be with you, my wife and Elizabeth and I. Um, it's just an honor to be here. Chad and Danette are just great, great friends and such dynamic leaders. And I told the first service this because you don't often get to hear, you get to see their leadership in this room, in this space, in this county. But what you don't have the, the opportunity to see is their leadership um, around our state and our tribe and our denomination and around the nation. And um, Chad's voice, Pastor Chad's voice is one that speaks so loud. When he speaks, people listen. Um, he's in, um, he's in leadership in our state. We serve on a council together that kind of oversees, um, the, this, this state. And, um, I'm just telling you, you're, you're blessed. And I hope that you recognize the gift that you have in pastor Chad and Danette. and I hope you regularly let them, let them know that. And then what this church has been doing, man, I've heard for so many years now about the growth and how you're just taking this, this city and this County for Jesus and what God's doing around this place. And I'm so proud of you for sharing, sharing the word. How many know, whenever you get out there and you start talking about it, people start showing up, you know, it's like when you get some ice cream, everybody wants to know where you got it at, right? Whenever you walk out there with joy and peace and happiness and you're overcoming things, people want to know, where'd you get that at? You tell them we came to the point church, right? And you want something you can come in to rub off on you too. Jesus will get all over you in this place. All right. And um, so let's just keep spreading the good news. Amen. And if you're not connected, if you're not serving somewhere, you've been here for a while, let me just speak from a pastor's voice. Man, we'd love to have you join the team here at, at the point. And um, those of you who do serve, I'll speak as a pastor again. Thank you for what you do. Couldn't do church without you. It wouldn't be what it is without you. Me and Elizabeth pulled up in the parking lot today and I saw all those parking attendants out there and all the greeters at the front door. I felt like I'd already been in church before I ever walked in church because they just fired me up for Jesus. Amen. And, and I'll tell you, those are big jobs. They're really big jobs. The people who, who work the doors, I always tell our folks, I, I think some, some of the most important jobs in the whole church. You know why? Because every morning you're holding those doors open for people who've had doors closed on them all week. And when they walk through those, those doors, they see that open door as an open heart for them to receive whatever it, they need to receive from the Lord. So thank you for serving that way. Give yourselves a big, big hand, will you? You're awesome. And, um, oh, and I, I got I to say thank you to, to um, a legend in the faith, um, Pastor Jerry Chitwood, Pastor Emeritus here. He's the man, isn't he? He is just like, he is all kind of cool. I hope when I'm, when I'm retired, I'm as cool as Jerry. And uh, he's just an awesome, oh, I don't know if he's even here to hear that. Y'all can tell him I said it. Maybe it'll get me somewhere. <laughs> uh, how many are ready for God's word? Yeah. All right, we don't have a lot. What time am I supposed to end here? I forgot. To, what time do I need to end? Three this evening. <laughs> Three this evening. <laughs> you somebody better bring lunch. Okay, okay, I'll be done. I don't have a whole lot of time. Hey, I started off the early service, told them about these two guys I heard about. They, um, they love to play baseball, grew up together, played a lot of ball all their life. They always, they always ask the question, is there going to be baseball when we get to heaven? They had this agreement, whoever dies first, they'll get to heaven. And um, they'll go ask St. Peter, hey, is there baseball in heaven? One guy dies, he gets to heaven, he asks Peter, Peter, is there baseball? Peter says, yeah, good news, there's baseball. So he calls back down, he says to his buddy, hey, good news, there's baseball in heaven. He looked up and he said, that's awesome. I'll see you soon. He said, no, sooner than you think you're scheduled to pitch on Thursday. <laughs> he, he didn't have as much time left as he wanted. I don't have as much time left as I want. So let's get right into God's word. Amen. What I want to, what I want to talk to you about today, I believe is going to feed your spirit. I believe it's going to leave you better. I think if you, if you allow it to, God's word has the power to change or reset the trajectory of your life. You know, I say it all the time. I don't, I don't. I don't, um, I don't ever want to miss my destiny. Anybody believe there's something big over your life? Let me ask you this. Anybody believe there's something bigger than where you are right now that God has for your life? I'm going to ask you again because some of you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, you won't see it. Anybody believe there's something bigger over your life than what you're seeing right now? Say yes. Yes. See, here's what I know about you, all of you. I know that God didn't wake you up this morning, breathe his good breath into your fine body just for you to take up space on his good planet. 
He breathed breath in you today because there's something he wanted you to accomplish with your life that only your life can accomplish. And I want to talk to you about posturing yourself spiritually to be prepared for what God has for you. I mean, no, if you're not properly postured, you'll miss what God has. There's a proper posturing spiritually that we need to be. And I want to talk to you about a guy who is in that spot. I'll talk to you about a guy named Elisha, not Elijah with the J, but Elisha, the younger guy with the, with the SH. He was following a guy um, named Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet. He was bold. He was strong. He was courageous, did amazing things for God. One of the great pillars of, of, the, of the Old Testament. And um, Elisha had been watching his life and he said, I want to be, I want to be like that but I don't want to be just like that. I want to be more than that. He said, I don't want just what he's got. I want double what he's got. And he had, he had the faith and the boldness to ask God for what he was believing for. He said, God, I don't want to be like him. I want a double portion of what you've put on him. How many know when you ask God for big things, you get big things. If you believe God for small things, you'll get small things. Elisha liked him because he had the faith to ask. He had the faith to pray bold prayers and ask God for, for a, a bold return on his, on his faith. It's a great picture of, of um, the fact that you're always being watched. Elisha was watching Elisha. How many know you're always being watched? The question is always, should you be followed? Elisha was watching a man that he wanted to follow. He wanted to learn from him. But he also wanted to grow beyond him. My dad always told me, son, as high as I go, that's not where you stop. My dad always said, son, my shoulders are your platform. My, you stand on my shoulders and go higher. My ceiling in life is your platform in life. That's what Elisha saw in Elijah. He said, God, as far as you've taken him, I want to go there and I want to go twice as far. And my hope is that you'll, you'll have a faith like that before you leave today. That's my title, a faith like that. When you leave, I hope you'll get in your car and you'll turn to somebody that you're riding with and say, I want a faith like that. If you came solo, you'll look in your rearview mirror and you'll say, you know what, I want a a faith like that. Because it's only when we get a faith like that that we get to live like that. So I want to talk to you about Elisha's life and what made it. So let me give you some context. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 19. And um, we're going to camp out right there for the entire, entire message today. But let me just give you the context of where they were. As, uh, Elisha's an ordinary guy. He's living actually an adult male, living with his mom and dad, working their farm. He, um, he didn't come from like a spiritual um, heritage or pedigree. He wasn't a monk. He wasn't a priest. His mama's daddy. Nobody was, uh, you know, held any office in, in the church. He was an ordinary guy who postured himself in the right place for God to do extraordinary things through his life. He was, um, he was working the farm. He was, the Bible says, you'll see, he was, just, he was just plowing. He was plowing the land. It was about the ninth century BC when this takes place. It's about the ninth century, right before, before Christ and Um, Israel's in a difficult place. Israel's divided. There's lots of tension in Israel. There's more people actually worshiping the gods of Baal than are worshiping God Jehovah. It was a season that God needed to move and he needed to find somebody he could move through. And he sees this young guy who had faith in God that he could do great things for God. He was an ordinary guy, but he had extraordinary dreams. He had extraordinary faith. And because an ordinary guy dreamed with extraordinary dreams and he lived with extraordinary faith, God did extraordinary things in his life. He said, God, I want to do twice as much as Elijah. I want to perform twice. And you know what happened? God did through his life. He actually performed more miracles than anybody else in the Bible except for Jesus. Why? Because he had the faith to ask. Because he prayed bold prayers. And when he prayed God bold prayers, God did great things in, in his life. Let me read the story to you. Beginning in verse 19 of 1 Kings chapter 19, it says that Elijah, the older guy, he went from where he was from there and he found Elisha, who's the son of Shaphat. He said Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. That means there's 12 oxen, the 12th pair, there's two. He's managing those two. He's behind the plow. And Elisha, the Bible says, went up behind him and he threw his cloak over him. Elisha then left the oxen and he ran after Elijah. 
He said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and then I'll come and I'll follow you. Elijah said back to him, he said, what have I done to you? In other words, he was saying, what have I done to give you this kind of faith to follow me? So Elisha, Elijah, Elijah, he left and he went back and he took his yoke of oxen. Now, this is the crazy part. And he slaughtered them. And then the Bible says he burned his plow and all the equipment and he cooked the meat and he gave the meat to the people and they ate it. And then he set out to follow Elijah and he became Elijah's servant. That's a great picture of obedience. It says that he's just, he's just minding his business, doing his own thing, living his life, what he had done for a long, long time, working the family farm, says he's got his hand to the plow. He's got 12 oxen out there working. He's controlling the, 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 the last two. And he's faithful. He's just faithful. I read a, I read a book several years ago by um, Stephen Furtick. He wrote, Stephen Furtick wrote a book on Elisha. And he said something in that book that I'd never really thought about before. And that was the power of, of monotony how, and how monotony and, 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 the, media, and, and, and the, um, this, the, the same old thing over and over and over again, the, the monotonous lifestyle of getting up, doing the same thing day after day after day can zap a person of their passion, can rob them of their passion, rob them of their joy, steal their, their dreams and begin to think about Elisha. He's faithful doing what he was doing, but he did the same. He spent his whole life on the backside of an ox. How many know the view is not very nice from there? I mean, he spent his whole life smelling the same stuff every day, seeing the same residue every day, breathing in the same dust every single day with his hands on the same plow every single day, doing the same thing day after day after day. And some of you, maybe you're here today and maybe you feel like your life has become so much so much minutia and it's so much of the same thing over and over and over, just monotony after monotony after monotony. You get up, you go to work, you see the same people, talk to the same people, say the same things. But you know what I like about Elisha? He was faithful doing what he was doing. He was faithful. You know why I got God's attention? Because he was faithful. The only way we get to do big things is when we're faithful with the little things. So many of us, we want to do big things, but we don't have the, the faith to like jump into a big thing and we don't have the humility to stand back and do the small things. But the Bible says it's only when we do the, the small things that we're found faithful to do the big things. I, I don't know what it may be for you. Maybe, maybe your life, maybe you're a, 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 a mom and, and you feel like your whole life is is. Diapers, dishes, and laundry. Diapers, dishes, and laundry. Diapers, dishes, and laundry. Diapers, dishes, and laundry. Diapers, dishes, and more laundry. Come on, moms. You know what I mean? Diapers, dishes, and laundry. How many know it's easy to lose your passion in the middle of all that? Maybe you're out in sales and somebody else is setting all your quotas for you, telling you how much you have to sell and what your quota is for the year. You're pushing the same product, telling the same stories, reading the same lines week after week after week after week. And you feel like it's minutia after minutia and it's just monotony and it's hard to get passionate. Maybe you're a student and maybe you're, you're in school and maybe you're, you're working your way through school. You're paying your way through school and you get up, you go to class, you study, you go to work, you go to class, you study, you go to work, you go to class, you study, you go to work, you go to class you study and you go to work. You go to class, you study and you go to work. And it's just the monotony and the same old thing day after day. That's where Elisha was. It was the same thing, pushing the same plow behind the same cows day after day. But here's what we have to recognize. He was faithful. He was faithful in the little things. And his faithfulness in the little things is what got God's attention to push him into some bigger things. First of all, you got to know that the man was faithful. God's looking for faithful people that he can, that he can trust, that he can, that he can depend on. And I don't know what it, what it might be for you, but, but the Bible says that God looked down on this man and he said, that's a person I can trust with big things. It was, I mean, it was all kind of emotions. It drained him physically and, and spiritually and it had to drain him, drain him emotionally. But in the midst of it all, he was, he was faithful. And God looked down and saw his faithfulness. And because God saw that he could trust him to be faithful in this, he, he realized that now I can, I can trust him in, in that. And then you move on to the next verse and it says, and Elijah went up to him and he threw his cloak over him. You're like, what does that even mean? Well, his cloak, it represented his coat, his coat that was made of fur. 
And, and, and what he was saying symbolically was the thing that has covered me is now going to cover you. The mantle that was on me is now going to be on you. That thing that I was under now is over you. He says, I'm going to be your mentor. I'm going to be your teacher. I'm going to be your leader. You'll be my student. You'll follow me. I'm going to show you the things that God has for you. And then God's going to do great things through you. That's what he, it meant when he took that coat and he just threw it over, threw it over Elisha. It's a powerful picture of, of, of symbolism. But in this whole story, that's the context. Now let me give you two principles. Two principles that we learn that are so important if you want to live with a faith like that. And the first one we, we see is, is this principle, this idea that I don't, have to, I don't have to fully understand to quickly obey. You posture yourself in a spiritual position to be able to be used by God when you don't have to fully understand everything before you're willing to fully obey everything. I'll quickly obey even when I don't fully understand. I'll quickly move even when I don't fully understand. See, that's a hard thing for some of us because we want all the answers. We want the T's crossed and we want the, dot, the I's dotted before we move out because we don't want to make a mistake. We want to know where we're going before we start going. But to live with this kind of faith, you've got to say, no, I don't have to fully understand to fully, to fully obey. It says, it's, the Bible says this. It says that he left his oxen and he ran and he followed Elijah. He said, let me kiss my mother and father goodbye. Then I'll come and follow you. Did you see? Not, not, don't look at what he did. Look at what he did not do. He didn't call a counselor. He didn't jump on Facebook or Instagram and ask his friends. He didn't look for pop, popular opinion. He didn't run a SWOT analysis. He didn't, you know, write out his strengths and his weaknesses and his opportunities and his threats. He didn't wrote, run a pro forma. He didn't list the pros and the cons of going with his prophet. He just said, God, I believe you're in it, so I'm going. He didn't consult anybody else. He, he didn't fully under, he didn't know where he was going to eat. He didn't know where he was going to sleep. He didn't know what the future would look like. He didn't fully understand, but he said, God, I'm still willing to quickly obey. Why? Because he believed that God was in it. See, if you want to posture yourself in a position for God to use you greatly, we've got to be in a place where we'll say, God, I don't have to fully understand before I'm willing to, to quickly and, and, and fully and, and, and right now obey. Instead of planning for the future, you know what I want to be? I want to be postured right now. Instead of planning my whole future, I want to be in a position right now that I am postured to move when God says move and go where God says go. I want to be ready for God, what God wants to do now, not just anticipating what God wants to do five years from now. The world is moving so fast. The world is changing so fast. Technology has changed everything. You don't know what three years is going to look like, much less five years or 10 years. And I want to be in a spiritual position. I want to be margined in my time, margined in my money, margined in my faith, margined in every area of my life. So when God says, go, I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to have all the answers. I can be in a position that I'll say, God, I'm going to move right now, even though I don't understand fully. And you know what God will do? God will lead you when you do that. You know how God usually works? God, God doesn't always give the details. Anybody ever been like, you knew God wanted you to do something, but you didn't have the details. And you're like, God, I want to work this out first. Come on, anybody? You know what I've learned in my life? God rarely gives the details. In fact, I think he intentionally leaves the details vague because God knows me. And he says, he says, Shepherd, you want the, you want the details? You can't handle the details. God knows. He says, if I showed you the details, you wouldn't even show up. So God leaves them vague. He doesn't show me. But if you want to really be used by God, you've got to Posture yourself spiritually where well, you're ready to quickly obey even when you don't fully understand. Because God's looking for people who will just trust him. And you know what I found about God? He, he often uses just one word. You ever just felt like you heard one word from God? It's like, one, but he does it all the way through the Bible. When you think about, um, think about Moses. You remember Moses, God said, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to set my people free. Millions of them. You remember that story? What did God say? Did he give him, he didn't give him a, a, a game plan. He didn't give him instructions. He just his, gave him one word. He said, go. You remember Abraham, the father of our faith. He said to Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave the land that you're in, the land that you know, and I want you to go 
to another land, go to a, a land that I will show you. He just said, well, he said, just go. He didn't show him first. He didn't explain it first. Abraham got one word. And then think about this one. You remember Peter? You remember Peter when the disciples were out on the, on the, on the lake and, and a storm rose up and they're all freaking out on the boat. And then they see a ghost coming across the water. You remember the story? I mean, they're all freaked out. And then the, the ghost gets closer and closer. And, and, and they say, that's not a ghost. It's Jesus. You remember that? And then Peter looks out and he says, Jesus, is that you? And I don't know what Jesus says, but Peter says, if it's you, bid me come out to you. And how many remember what Jesus said? One word. He didn't say, put your floaties on, Peter. He didn't say, grab your skis. He said, come. And Peter became the first man that ever walked on the water. I don't know how long. I don't care how long he walked. He walked on the water. Because he was quick to obey when he didn't fully understand. And the first thing this story teaches us about being people that are postured in a position to really do great things for God is we've got to be in a position that we're willing to say, God, even when I don't fully understand, I will quickly, quickly, quickly obey. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you're married and your marriage is a mess. And maybe everything in you wants to quit. You want to throw in the towel, you know, cash in all your chips and you want to walk. You hear one word, and the word is stay. You don't know how, you don't know how long, you don't know why, you don't, you don't know anything. You don't understand anything except I'm living in what feels like hell on earth in this home, and I want out, but you hear stay. Maybe you're, you're here, and maybe you've gotten a bad report from a doctor. You don't understand it. You don't understand how it happened, why it happened. You don't understand when it happened. You don't understand what you're going to have to do to get past this illness. But you hear just, you just, in the midst of all the pain, you hear one word. You hear, you hear trust, trust. And all you do is trust. You just trust and you just to begin to declare the word of the Lord. In Psalms 56, it says, when I was afraid, I'll put my trust in you. Jeremiah 17 says, trust in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 37, it says, when you trust in, in the Lord, he'll, he'll bring those things to you that you desire. Psalms 95, it says, I was afraid, but I put my trust in him, the one I praised, and I was no longer afraid. Trust in the Lord. Years ago, we were building a, a new building on a piece of property. We were buying 54 acres, and we were paying $1.7 million for the property. Um, seven days before the closing, me and Elizabeth had just gone down to Daytona. We landed at the airport. Her mom and dad had picked us up from the airport. I got a phone call from a, a guy at a bank. He said, hey, so-and-so um, asked me to call you and let you know that we're very sorry, but we're not going to be able to do the deal on your property. I'm like, you mean the deal that closes seven days from now that you've already committed yourself to that deal? He said, yeah, I'm very sorry. We're not going to be, the, be able to do the deal. And I knew you can't argue with the bank. And I hung up the phone and I'm like freaking out. And because how many know it's hard to find $1.7 million in seven days? <laughs> and I heard, I heard the Lord say, build. And I got, Elizabeth can tell you, I got a peace in my heart. We enjoyed those few days with her parents. I got a peace in my heart. It was already Friday. What are you going to do on Saturday and Sunday? I got back. And you know what happened on Monday? On Monday. Listen, on Monday. They were asking me, how's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? I don't, I don't know. How's it going to happen? A banker called me. I didn't even call a banker. A banker called me and said, hey, I hear y'all need some money. I said, oh, boy, do we need some money. <laughs> And he said, we'd like to give it to you. I said, it's $1.7 million. He said, yeah, we'd like to give it to you. We closed on that property. We've never left that bank. That bank has given us better deals than any other bank in America has given anybody I know in America because God brought it to pass. You know why? Because we operated on one word. Maybe you're here today and maybe you're, you've got a dream that God's put on the inside of you. Maybe it's to start a business. Maybe it's to... To, to do something different than you're doing now. Maybe, 
Maybe it's to write a book. Maybe it's to, to write a song. Maybe it's to start a ministry. And, and your, your heart, your mind is flooded with all the questions. Why, how, who, when? And the word you hear from the Lord is start. Just start. Are you, are you spiritually postured in a place that you can quickly obey even when you don't fully understand? Because you see, that's when you begin to see the miraculous. Let me tell you this. Obedience, our obedience always precedes his miraculous. You can read the Bible through and through and you know what you'll never find? You'll never find God's miraculous without somebody else's obedience first. Because our obedience always, always, always precedes God's miraculous. Are you, are you postured in a place spiritually that you can act quickly even when you don't understand fully? Because I, I don't know about you, but I want to, I just, I want a faith. I want a faith like that. Maybe you've been kicking the tires at church for a long time, but you've never really committed and you just, you know, maybe you bounce from church to church or maybe you're in and you're out and you haven't never, you've never really said, you know what, it feels like home, I'm gonna make it home. Maybe the word that you hear from the Lord today is commit. Commit yourself to the house of the Lord. I don't know what it is for you, but I know often in my life and what I read in scripture is that God often reveals his will to us with just one word. Years ago, when Elizabeth and I um, started started dating, um, I was I was almost thirty, and she was she was like young because I went to the playground to find me a girlfriend, <laughs> and um, and um, and she was from you know one one track in life, and you know my my her her track was was jet set corporate track, and and mine was like ministry and. Um, she was from the north. I was from the south, and we were Protestant. She was Catholic, and um, just everything about our stories was like, "This is just isn't going to work out. This just shouldn't work." But a, just a short time in, I mean, like weeks, maybe maybe a month or two into her and I dating each other, she dated some guys, and I dated some girls. And um, but I heard, I just heard, uh, like her, she, her, her, she's she's the one. And I was hoping it was God because she was smoking hot. And I was like, I wanted, I was like, God, God let that be you. And, um, and, and, um, and our relationship grew. But about a year in, I was a student pastor and she was traveling all the time. And we had a big group and very, very busy. And um, it just kind of got sideways. And one night we'd been out on what I thought was a good date. And we get back to her place and she dumped me like, like a rock, like a hot rock. Boom. Just, just drop me over, done. And I'm like, well, what'd that do? And she says, it's just not going to work out. She's not, I, I didn't do anything. It's like, it's just not going to work out. And she just, she just dumped me. So I left. And um, a while later, um, I'm laying in bed one night and it's about two o'clock in the morning. I couldn't sleep. And um, I heard, I heard the Lord, I heard the Lord say, um, go. And I knew the Lord was saying, go back to Elizabeth. And I'm like, no. She dumped me. I didn't dump her. I ain't begging no girl to hang out with me. I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fish in the ocean. I ain't doing it. And, and I, I'm not going. And um, besides, I, what am I going to say? Please, please, please don't dump me. <laughs> Listen, I mean, I love you. That ain't happening, you know? I'm not doing that. And, and I didn't know what to say. I, I'm not going. So I'm, I'm grateful that, that I, I laid there, wrestled with God for a while longer. But I'm so grateful. Listen. I'm so grateful that, um, and listen, I, I mess up a lot and there's a lot of stories of my mistakes and failures I could tell you about, but I'm going to tell you about this one that wasn't. I'm so glad that that night there was a faith like that on the inside of me. I'm, I'm grateful that that night there was something, there was something in me that night that had the power to tick, to kick my ego in the gut, it had the power to smash my pride and get me up out of bed and be obedient, put my clothes on and start driving to her house. Because I didn't know what, I didn't know what to say. This, this Catholic girl, I was told her, you're a bad Catholic, you're dating the priest. And now I tell her she's sleeping with him. She's even a worse Catholic, that's not good. Uh, that's too much information, I'm sorry. But you know when the Lord starts speaking to me about what to say? on the drive. 
You know why? Because watch this. Because obedience always precedes the miraculous. And it was when I was driving. I only lived a mile and a half from her. But the Lord downloaded exactly what I needed to say to her. I didn't know. I hadn't thought about it. Never thought about this before. But what you don't know is, is she was engaged three times before me. Um, her first fiance was coming out of Madison Square Gardens and a drunk driver drove up on the steps, hit him and killed him. Her second, your second fiance um, cheated on her. And her third fiance lied to her. Everything she knew about his life was a lie. And then she comes to me, you know, this preacher boy in the South, and um, trust was just gone. There was just no trust left inside of her. And um, so the Lord, and I never thought about this before. It wasn't until, listen, it wasn't until I quickly obeyed when I didn't fully understand that God began to tell me, when you get to her house, tell her that I'm tired of her past control in her present. And as long as her past, she allows her past to continue to control her present, she has no hope of the future that I have for her. And it was at that moment that she dropped to her knees and begged me to spend the rest of my life with her. <laughs> All right, everything about that story is true except that last part. Uh, uh, uh. But I, I think about that story and, I, and, and I'm, it gets, I'm emotional about the story because I either have to laugh about it or I'll cry about it. Because I look at my kids and I think, what would have happened if I didn't, if I'd missed that moment? What would have happened if I was, if, if I refused to obey when I didn't fully understand? I wouldn't have Hope and Harrison. I wouldn't have a son-in-law. We wouldn't be ready to be becoming the youngest grandparents in the history of the world. <laughs> I wouldn't have the church that I get to pastor today. I wouldn't be here with you today. Because it would have shifted my entire destiny. Is it possible that maybe you've missed part of your destiny? Because you've not been quick to obey when you didn't fully understand? Is, is it possible that there's things that you know you should do, but you haven't done? because you don't understand? Has the fear of uncertainty or fear of the unknown robbed you of the opportunity that God's placed in front of you? I don't know. I just know the Lord sent me here to ask you. Are you postured spiritually in a place that you can quickly obey even when you don't fully understand. Because you have to you know, ask the question, what are, we, what are we teaching our kids? I mean, when we, when we don't operate in faith, we hold back because of fear. What are we teaching our kids? Are we... Come on, what, what are we teaching our kids? Because here's what I know. If you've got kids in the room, you're not teaching your kids what you know. You're teaching your kids who you are. Because we don't, we don't you know, regenerate what we know. We regenerate who we are. Your kids are watching you more than they're hearing you. Sometimes our kids can't hear what we're saying because they're seeing what we're doing. What are, what are our kids seeing in our posture of faith? Are, we, are our kids seeing us 
act in faith, operate in faith, live in faith, that gives them the potential and the power to rise up in faith and trust God for big things in their life? Or is it possible that we could, could actually teach our kids to miss their destiny because we teach them to hold back because of fear, to lag back because of uncertainty, just to resist because of the unknown? Listen, my dad always told me, and I've lived by this my whole life, I'd rather get it wrong trying to get it right than never get it right because of living with the fear of getting it wrong. I'm not worried about my kids failing. Let them fail. I hope they fail a lot because you know what? As long as they're failing, at least it means they're trying. And I'm more worried about my kids missing their destiny because they're afraid of failing than I am them failing. Because if you fail enough, it will push you forward. But if you resist the fear of failure because you don't know, Elisha was a man who simply said, God, I believe you're in it and I'm moving. He says to the man of God, Elijah, he doesn't, he doesn't even know Elijah really. He's just been following his ministry, following his life. Like, I want to be like that guy. He's out plowing, working his daddy's farm. Doesn't give a two-week notice. Doesn't consult his friends. He just says, let me kiss mom and dad by, and I'm gone. Anybody want a faith like that? You want a faith like that? That's what I pray for. The second thing that I'm going to close with, I'm going to close with this. I really am. I told him in the first service, you know what it means when a preacher says I'm closing? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Like, here's my last point until God gives me another one. I just blame it on God. Hey, by the way, when I had that conversation with Elizabeth, this was hilarious. When I went back, I left my house. <laughs> I left my house. You know, God tells me what to say. I get to her house. And my first lines were, she's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, God told me to tell you. <laughs> I mean, you know, as, when you're trying to get a girl back, that's always a good line. You know what I mean? <laughs> God told me to tell you. It's funny. It had nothing to do with where I'm at now, but that was funny. Uh, but the, the, the second thing was, was this, the second principle. Not only do you have to have the... Um, it will be postured spiritually that you can quickly obey even when you don't fully understand. But the second principle, and I'm done, is this. God, God uses people who, who can let go of what they have to gain what they desire. I mean, you've heard people say sometimes you got to lose something to gain something. God uses people who are willing to let go of what they have. You know what happened? You heard the story. I don't have to read it again. Elisha slaughters the, cow, the, the, the oxen, the cattle, and he burns the plows. Think about that. He kills the cows, burns the plows. In other words, you know what he's saying? I got no plan B. I got nothing to go back to. I'm all in. All chips are in. I'm not like, well, God, we'll go for a few days, see how it works. If it doesn't work out, you know, I'll come back to the farm. No, I already burned the plows and killed the cows. That's the kind of posture that God wants to use. I'm all in. I'm all in. I mean, if I'm a dad, you know, I'm talking to my kids. I'm like, hey, now, listen, you, you might need a plan B, son. You might need a plan B. If this thing doesn't work out with this gray-haired prophet, you might want something to come home as a father. How many, how many of you parents, that's, that's the advice you'd give your kids? That's not, the, that's not the advice that God gives his kids. In fact, our father gives us this advice. Without faith, it's impossible to please me. Anybody want a faith like that? Maybe you're here in the room. Musicians, the musicians can come. I'm, I'm finished. But I want to pray with you for a moment. Because I believe there's, there's probably some people in the room today who... You have something on your life that you felt God calling you into, but you've been, you've been afraid to step into it. You don't have all the answers. It feels like all the doors haven't opened. And maybe today God sent me from Athens to tell you to start, to step, 
to go, to trust, to move. I don't know what it may be for you, but I know for me, I want a faith like that. I don't want anything to stop me from the destiny that God has for me. And listen, I've, I've missed a lot of moments because of fear. I've, I've missed a lot of moments because I wanted answers that God didn't give. But I don't want you to miss another moment. I believe there's some of you maybe here today and you just would say, Scott, I just, I just need, I need courage to do what he's called me to do, to go where he's called me to go, to start what he's called me to start. Others of you are here and maybe there's a dream in your heart. You just need a word from God. Maybe you need to hear go. Maybe you need to hear start. Maybe your prayer needs to be, God, give me ears to hear you. Through all the white noise, give me ears to hear you. I don't know about you. But I want to to pray for you. If, If everyone would stand and this is my invitation. If you believe there's something bigger for your life than where you are right now and you want to be postured spiritually to move when God says move, to go where God says go. You want the courage to act in faith and not lean back on fear. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to step out of your seat and come join me in the altar, not because there's anything mystical or magical about this place, but I just believe if you can't step out in here, you're going to have a hard time stepping out there. And this may be somebody's first step to a new future, to a new legacy, to a new opportunity. And I'd love to pray with you. I'm going to ask those of you that are in the altar just to lift your hands toward heaven and receive from the Lord. And those of you that are still sitting, if it's not too awkward for you, I'm going to ask you just to stretch your hands toward these that are in the altar. It took courage to come down here. Now I want us to pray for them. I want you to pray that God would give them ears to see, to hear, and eyes to see. Pray that God would increase their courage. Pray that the step they took to this altar is the first step of their obedience and God's purpose and call on their life. There's new businesses that are going to start in this altar. There's new opportunities. There's new ministries that are going to start. There's relationships that are going to be healed. There's forgiveness that's going to be generated. There's books that's going to be written. There's promotions that are going to happen because somebody moved. Here's what I want you to do first. I want you just to, in in the altar, just begin thanking God for what you're believing him for. Whatever it is you're believing for the healing, thank him for the healing. For the provision, thank him for the provision. For the joy, thank him for the joy. For the clarity, thank him for the clarity. Thank God for what you're believing him for. Just right now, just begin to to thank God. God, we thank you. Lord, I thank you that my kids are blessed, that my kids are protected. God, I I thank you that you're guarding their hearts and you're surrounding them with right relationships, relationships that'll build them up and never tear them down. God, I thank you that my wife and my marriage is, is protected, that it's guarded, that you've got a hedge around our hearts. God, I thank you that our church is blessed that our church is anointed, that our church is life-giving, that our church is populating heaven and plundering hell because of your presence that's there. God, I declare it and I claim it in your name. Give us courage to be postured spiritually that we can move when you say move and go where you say go and stop where you say stop. God, I thank you for it. I thank you for it even now. Lord, I just speak over every man, over every woman, over every person who's made their way to your altar this morning. God, you know their hearts. You know their dreams. You know their hopes. You know their destinies. You know their purpose. Before you formed them, you saw this moment in them. God, I pray you honor their faith and their faithfulness. 
Lord, that we would be so faithful and attentive to the little things that we get heaven's attention and reminds them that we can be trusted with the bigger things. Lord, that we'd be courageous enough to, to go when you say go, to move when you say move, to trust when you say trust, to start when you say start, when we don't have the answers. May we be quick to obey. Posture us spiritually, God, so that we can hear you and move with you. Do your work. Do your work in every life, in every heart. God, speak your word. Don't let us miss a destiny moment. Don't let us hold back in fear and lose what you want to give us through faith. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now one more time, just begin thanking God for it, will you? Come on, thank him for courage. Thank him for boldness. Thank him for, for strength, for peace, for joy. Thank him for stamina. Thank him for faith that's rising up on the, on the inside of you. Come on. How many believe God's done something already this morning? Here's what I want us to do before we go. Just stay in the altar, if you will doesn't feel right to me leaving a gospel preaching church without a gospel message some of you are here and maybe you came into the right place God's house but you came in the wrong way and that is outside of a relationship with him maybe you came by invitation with someone maybe you once lived for Jesus but you've drifted away and you're not living for him right now and throughout the service maybe the Holy Spirit's tapped on your heart I'm going to tell you what I told the first service. I'm not going to give you an invitation to give your life to Jesus because I'm afraid that you're going to die tomorrow and have to face eternity. I'm going to give you an invitation to life in Jesus because I found that life with Jesus is a whole lot better than life without Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus in this place today, this is an opportunity for you to get your life right with Jesus. So if you're here, every head open up and every eye opened because this ought to be the greatest part of every church service. We all, listen, if you, you should want the whole world to see. The Bible says the only time heaven's going to ever throw a party for you is when you make a decision to follow him. I, I promise you, heaven's not throwing a party because of my sermon today. God's not going to look over heaven and say, that was good right there. Only time you'll get celebrated in heaven is when you give your life to Jesus. So today, if you're here in the room and you feel the presence of God saying, you need to come home. You need to come home. And you're ready to give your life to Jesus and say, Scott, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit my life today to live for Jesus for the rest of my life because I believe living with him is better than living without him. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand and I want to see you. I want to see you face to face. Bless you, sir. I bless you. Come on, give him a hand, will you? Come on. Know anybody else? Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Come on, anybody else? Anybody in the balcony? Anybody at all? Come on, anybody over here on this side? Anybody at all? You feel the Holy Spirit? Just raise your hand. Look at me. How about on this side of the room? God bless you, sir, in the back. God bless you. Come on, let's make some noise. Let's celebrate it. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Anybody else over here? Anybody else? All right. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close. We're going to pray this prayer. I want everybody in the room, if you know Jesus, let's pray this prayer with our new family, can we? You pray this prayer, the Bible says you'll be as saved as anybody in this room. Your first day is as good as my best day. Amen. Because we're all in Jesus and old things pass away and all things become new. Amen? Come on, you ready? If you raise your hand, pray it. We're going to all pray it with you. Say it with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace that covers my deepest sin. Thank you for your love that loves me on my worst days. Thank you that you see the best in me when I don't see it in myself. Thank you for the cross. Today I believe you died. You rose again so that I could have life in you. Forgive me. Give me a new start, a fresh beginning. And I'll live for you for the rest of my life. Empower me by the Holy Spirit. In your name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Come on, let's sing together. 
Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We hope that the message was a blessing to you and an encouragement to you. If it was, we'd just like to take a few more seconds of your time and ask you to do a few things. First of all, if you don't mind, there's a digital connection card that you could submit and, and, and send our way, and it'll let us stay connected to you more personally. First, it'll let, you, let us know who you are. Second, how frequent, frequently you tune in. And also, there's a place for prayer requests, and we would love to partner with you and pray about what's going on in your life. The second thing that would be great is if you could just take a moment, click a link, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay connected with what's going on at The Point every week. And also, man, if this was a blessing to you today, it might be an encouragement and a blessing to somebody in your friend group or in your network of influence. So why don't you just share this video and pray that God uses it to encourage them as well. Finally, if uh, you'd like to consider blessing this ministry financially, there's a giving link at the bottom. You can click down there and that'll help us continue to throw out videos like this that could be a life changer for somebody out there. So guys, thank you again for joining us. We're so blessed that you did. We're so honored to have you as a part of our online family. And we want you to know one more thing. We love you so much and we can't wait to see you next time.